Welcome everybody here to your coverage of the ESL1 Frankfurt European Qualifier. I'm with Hani, very special guest. He's in Berlin and actually it's nice having him in the studio a lot more now. Um, and hopefully we'll have a better game for you this time around. Last time you were in the studio it wasn't really that entertaining. But this time around it should be a lot better. Yeah, I believe so too. I mean, having the the final qualifier for the ESL one, I believe it's the last. It's one? the last team. It's the last team. Last e one? Everyone else is already known, but this is the last team to be c can be confirmed. It's gonna be quite interesting, especially running into the new patch. We're gonna have, uh, I believe, most most teams didn't have too much inside yet, but with a past tournament that just ran, the Aces played cool. Maybe some or both of the teams got some sort of insight what works for either of them. Mm -hmm. It's going to be exciting. Oh, it's, it's just to also explain to you why this game is on today, because I don't know if everyone was uh, tuning Navi's in last week when pick. we played the the first part of the final, which was when Team Empire played up against Cloud9 to see who would come advance here to play up against Na'Vi. Uh, but we actually ended up postponing it because the game which happened for Cloud9's match, and it was the last match they played, was on the night of the patch. So when that came... They said, hey guys, Queen can we actually prepare for this game? Can we prepare some level Cloud of strats? <laughs> Give us as many days as you possibly can. And this was it. Before Cloud9 are going to go and travel, um, they said, you know, this is going to be the best day coming for Wednesday. Na'Vi was all for it because they also Cloud wanted some extra prep time. And uh, Na'Vi have, I don't know if we want to class as a small advantage, but they played two series in Dream League last night as well. Um, went 2-0 their way and then against them 2-0 as well. So... Cloud9's had time to prepare and not show anything, while Na'Vi, they've shown a Ten little bit, but they've had also remaining. had that time to prepare for this game. Yeah, definitely, and um, Five seconds remaining. overall, I think you, you can't really <sighs> call a clear favorite for this series, I think. Cloud it's still very hard to determine to anyone, ban. because we haven't seen much at all yet. Yeah, I guess the upset for C9 is that they haven't shown anything officially yet, so they kind of could study what Na'Vi was trying to do so far, mm -hmm. but I still think it, there's no judgment to, Ten be, seconds yeah, to, to be given. From the games they played last night, it'd be pretty difficult to read exactly what Na'Vi want to do. Especially remaining. when Artstyle, like I think it was Bulba who tweeted out saying that Artstyle's draft just reminded him of TI2. Like it's almost just going backwards, trying some mod strategies, trying to work out what's what's working for your team as such. And for Cloud9, for me I feel this is the, the perfect meta for them. It's the meta which enables split push. It's the meta which enables you to go for trade decisions, which is probably Cloud9's Navi's biggest strength. Turn to ban. Um, I think partly, yeah, I, I can agree with that. The other, the other uh, upside I can see is especially team play. I mentioned this in the in the previous tournament that I think team play is going to be a bit more difficult in terms of Ten itemization that there's certain items that benefit you a lot in team fights now especially for support Five seconds mm -hmm. remaining. so i think going into this patch team play is going to be a high requirement <laughs> um but yeah like no, i think we should looking at picks and bans so far cloud i think the interesting f first two picks from cloud nine here are cl the dragonite as well as the chen i mean chen obviously one of the common picks no tail is known for the hero his micro is very great as the DK is more likely a rather questionable big so far with the old patch, but given the up the, the strength that he got with the current patch mm -hmm. on his nuke, that he reduces the damage of the Ten opponent to remaining. a certain percentage, yep. it's understandable pick here. Yeah, he's he's Five actually become one of the remaining. more popular mids. I don't have a stat for, but I know that a large amount of the games I was watching with the Red Bull uh, series last night and a couple of other things around the place, that the DK is becoming more and more Navi's powerful because it's it's kind of like this perfect blend. Like I was talking about how this matter becomes more of a trade thing. The one thing I've noticed is you're getting here as like DK who are really good at forcing down buildings early on. Obviously hit level six, level one dragon form, you can do that. But then you combine it with a Chen and now you also combine it with a Luna. They have a lot of strength when it comes to the team fights, a lot of survivability, but also pushing power and the ability to go a little bit later into the game. Ten yeah. seconds. Uh, one thing to mention right now is, given the three picks on each side, five seconds. That C9 remaining. has a very push heavy lineup, and Navi really has to watch out that they don't get just Reserve overrun here. Right now, they they're five and five is not great. Wisp is rather a split push hero mm -hmm. to orient into late game where you can five on five, but on the side of Cloud9 is very heavy five on five push. They're gonna end. They're gonna go for, from tower to tower, take Roshans potentially. So. Navi has to watch out that they don't get overrun here and they potentially have to look for a 5 and 5 hero right now. 
the, uh, a hero that can nuke out the waves. So Chen just can't stand in front with the creeps, and Luna and Dragonite just get to hit the tower. So they have to get a five and five hero. Cloud and the pickup by Bris of Brisebeck here is one of those heroes that can just stay in front. Mm -hmm. He is a pretty good hero with the Wisp in the early game, especially. So you can manage potentially that early push. But I still think it's going to be very difficult here for Navis at this point of view to handle the situation that Cloud9 is giving them. They at least have the upside where they could potentially run like this dual offline. I don't know how you feel about Nun dying being forced into more of a... Seconds into like this harassment support role on top. But because you're running Five the Bristleback as well remaining. as the Wisp, you can get away with these dual lanes and maybe that's where you can find your early levels and Reserve ways to stop time. that Cloud9 push. Um, I think previous, before this patch, in a one-on-one -on -one middle, when you see the Queen of Pain most likely going middle yep. against the Dragonite. Dragonite is going to be the middle hero. Fat is going to play Dragonite. He used to play that hero. I think in the old patch, that was probably one of the only heroes that Dra Dragonite got really forced out of the lane. He could potentially. But given the changes in the Breathe Fire, I'm not entirely sure how that is going to work out. He might have... Like, the Queen of Pain might have more difficulties manning up. Like, when you, for example, use the Shadow Strike, usually you would, like, try to harass three, four times, while Breathe Fire could potentially negate all that damage coming in. So um, what you prefer is what to move Queen of Pain to a different lane away from the DK? N no, I'm, I'm just... Oh, you're okay like, with it. What I'm just trying to say is pretty much that... it. You know, I, I'm not entirely sure yet how that mid... It, it's going to balance out, where it's going to balance out. Is Queen okay. of Pain still heavily in favor? Because... Shadow Strike just deals too much damage, remaining. or does it even up more with a Dragonite pick, uh, or the change Five rather in the Dragonite Breathe Fire? Mm -hmm. oh, we got ourselves a Visage, and uh, I'm kind of almost hoping that Navi's going to ban the Live Stealer after our game we cast the other day. It was uh, a bit brutal when you're able to also infest into these Visage birds, and you can just drop anywhere you want to. And uh, I'm mainly only flagging him just because the Live Stealer being run uh, in that third position is just getting more and more powerful. But I don't know if that's really what Cloud9 is searching oh, for in, in this fight. They have ran as Lifesteal in third position. I was like looking at it. I'm like, no, Lifesteal? No, how no, does it? Not Cloud9 in the, in this current patch. Oh, it okay. was um, I think it was Navi yesterday that actually ran oh. the the Lifesteal at third position. I mean, <sighs> as a hero for Funic, I can see it. As Cloud a hero for Bone Seven, I most back. likely would not see that happening. No. I think it's going to be still a Bone Seven hero. There's still a Bat Rider in the pool. Usually, you don't pick Bat Rider in combination with a Chen. Just because your jungle is not possible to form, Chen would take that. There's still a clockwork, I think, that is remaining. an option. Pretty okay, just in terms of early. Like, <sighs> clockwork kind of scales quite early. You have the hookshot. He Navi's is always good on offlane. And he might be a, a hindrance here for, for Navi. It's not banned out, so it can be a potential pick. Yeah. Well, they got their choice, but not yet. Navi's got to make their last one. The mag is being banned out by Cloud9. So, with that mag ban, it doesn't really flag the fact they know exactly what lanes are going to go there. It's probably more of a concern. They're just are more concerned about a buffed-up Bristleback more than anything Ten else with a potential teamfight control effect. Yeah, definitely. Um, right now, laning-wise, I remaining. think there's not too much given other... On C9 side, you would most likely see a, just time. a normal dual slash tri lane with a Chen bottom, DK middle, and an off laner. On Navi's side, it can still be contesting tri lane with a Wisp, Undying plus Bristle. Invoker. Oh, and an Invoker pickup. Interesting. Cloud9 well, was pick. on the money. That was It was the mid hero that's missing. But the Invoker is the last one. So now you've got Dendi's Invoker up against Fader's Dragon Knight. Could you almost switch the lanes out here for C9? I don't know what you can really do with this. Like, you're not going to send a Luna, Visage, Chen, Aggro lane, maybe. A DK can even function as a third position without like it, having that bottle. It should be a DK middle. DK is actually, especially with a change, I think DK is going to have an even remaining. easier time. Just because Invoker, most of his damage, there's no nuke that Five he has. He can remaining. push out waves with a nuke, especially on the early levels. So DK most likely even wins that matchup in the Reserve very start. Time. Um... I, I'm not entirely sure. It could be a Invoker short as well. So that they might do Invoker plus Undying on short lane, having a Queen middle. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> that the matchup middle benefits the Dragonite if it's an Invoker middle. Because you just, you're just you going to struggle just because of the damage reduction. Invoker yep. already has a very low damage like source. It has only physical damage that he does. And especially on the early levels, it's going to be very tough. But interesting last pickup here by by C9. You wanted a bow 7 here, I'm pretty sure Nick's assassin's up there. 
and it's probably one of the most annoying heroes, not just for the Queen of Pain, but also for Invoker. Invoker is going to have a very, very hard time by getting mana burned here. Mm -hmm. Well, then again, who are you going to focus on the mana burn? Like you got Invoker who's going to have a hard time, but Bristleback is also one of these very mana dependent style heroes. It, once it gets a bigger pull, obviously the Knicks won't have as much problem with that. Ten um, seconds remaining. But at the same time, you want to be controlling at the Bristleback and be worried about the Undying too. These guys, Five seconds if remain. you can limit their their mana pulls, you could potentially just have a, a you remove a huge factor of Navi's Navi's fighting power. Yeah, I think going into this game, to me, on paper, C9 probably has the better lineup. I think it's a lot easier to execute. Going into late game, I also would benefit C9 here. Just in terms of Visage still deals crazy amounts of damage. Does not get stopped by Bristleback now, since the change. You have a Luna that is going to deal a lot of damage throughout the in, throughout the entire game pretty much and a dragon and all these heroes have pretty decent scaling potential especially running tri like you kind of run a tricore having the visage on the side of navi you would almost assume they have to win the early early game slash mid game it probably getting roshan quite early to go into the mid game and then get and then push C9. But what has to sort of happen, I think, is they, they have to start a snowball somehow. And as you can see, bottom lane, going into the jungle. See, I, I'm... I, I agree with you, like, the fact, like, if there's an early start for Na'Vi, it's, it's wonderful. But I don't think C9 is capable of winning just easily into the later, later portion of the game. Uh, depending on how much Navi, like how much damage they can deal in that early stages, if you can control up the Radiant Jungle, if you can stop Chen from getting creeps, if you make sure he's basically a Hand of God and nothing more, then you're actually looking a lot stronger. And the Bristleback in the late game, even the Invoker with the changes that did come the way of the Invoker, there's like the changes to Deafening Blast, for example. There's some more things which just make the Invoker even even better and can bring a little bit more during the the later team fight. So. Yeah, I, I don't want to count Na'Vi out if we go into the late portion of the game. I think we'll actually have what is going to be a very spectacular even battle. But I understand your point though. Cloud9, they do still have a lot to work with. And if they don't get slowed down the early stages by Na'Vi, they could just roll over Na'Vi. Um, I agree with that. I think it's, it's mostly about how the early game runs. How C9 can stabilize their farm. If they don't get ganked too much, if the early game runs decent, they're going to end up in just going for pushes 5 on 5, and I think we're going to have the edge there. Well, let's actually just check out our lanes since we've already uh, started off. The balance as the creep waves have met, so it's going to be a dual offlane here by Cloud9. They're running Eternal Lane vs Luna, with Misery's Visage going up against the safe lane Invoker, who they're really getting aggressive on. Not going for the losing Beam, they're looking for the extra damage from the Luna Blessing to start with. While the mid lane's a dual lane from Na'Vi, so we have uh, Seneko as well as Havost, with the Wisp, Wisp and Brusselback combination up against Fader. There is still that one lonely player from Na'Vi, the secondary support player, which is the Undying, up, up, just hovering on the top lane for the moment. Down at the bottom is Funix Queen of Pain going up against Phone Seven Nyx Assassin, and no tell into the jungle as the Chen, and that wraps up the lanes. Yes, and the one thing I'd like to mention here, I think a clear favorite right now for C9 in these lane cases. Having a dual range setup against the Invoker on a safe lane, especially that it's Denny. I think Denny is one of those one of those persons that scales a lot when he gets momentum for himself. He likes to one-on-one, -on -one. he doesn't like to dual lane at all. He scales a lot when he gets that early farm. He's a playmaker, mid lane. Yeah, they're having a crack at him with a lot of nasal goos already being prepped up. And the uh, the quill spray starting to stack on Fader. Don't really have enough to bring him down, but it's more of just the harassment to make sure he's got to burn his bottle charges. The problem here, the, the, the entire damage of Na'Vi in the mid lane is physical. It's only physical damage. And Dragonite has such high armor gain, just because of his passive, that he's sitting on 7 armor right now. Take it, that, him, like, that, that he takes a lot of damage is almost non-existent. Especially he will get a stick very soon, so forcing him out of lane is going to be very tough, while he still gets a pretty good amount of farm. Like in comparison to no, the side lanes of Navi here, we have an Invoker that slowly forms up, but it's not easy at all. It's it's really hard for an Invoker to kind of like come back. He needs an early 
stage in the game. I play I, like I used to play a lot in Volker and I think one of the most crucial parts about this hero is that he needs levels more than anything. He doesn't have to have the greatest farm, but he really needs levels. So is, no, is it almost possible when you run the safe lane in Volker two to just run this hand of Midas? Because it looks like Denny's just going for phase boots to start with. He goes for a cross wax build, so it's it's very common to just go for the phase boots. You can go for Midas afterwards, but it's less likely to be seen. Um, but one thing I actually haven't thought of too much is that a Quaswax Invoker is a decent counter to a Chen. You would run Quaswax Invoker so you have a Tornado mana and the and the EMP to burn the Creep's mana and to just generally stop a push. You also take away all of your control during the fights. Bottom lane. Well, they're having a crack. It's uh, it's funny as well as Bone Seven just trading things off. I think overall that bottom lane benefits C9 though, I would say. Just because Bone 7 actually has to watch out here a lot. It's only a one point up in Scream, however, so it's not burst damage he's more worried about. It's just that Shadow Strike harassment keep, keeps coming in from the Queen of Pain. And that's keeping Bone 7 out of the lane, because he's got no regeneration. Funnick's running this bottle all the time. It doesn't look like he's being contested for those bottom runes yet. So if now you keep uh, are able to keep controlling both of these runes, you've got what? The bottom rune going to Funic, and you got the top rune going to the Wisp. Yeah, here they come down. So yeah, the Dark Troll Summoner is going to make sure that, that Queen of Pain can't keep running bottles easily without without wasting time with the courier. Still really surprising how much farm Eternal Envy's managed to pick up. There she dropped the Tombstone and the Decay into a Cold Snap. Wow, that's a lot more damage than Envy was really expecting, and it's enough to get the first blood. Arstyle's going to open up on the Captain of Cloud 9. And they really just made something out of... Like, I don't know if you, if you can call that a misposition from Envy. He wasn't up that far. No, they used, it, they used the advantage of... They used the advantage of just getting that early level... Or like... Once they had level 3, they have to make something happen. Out of it. It's not really an advantage, but... I guess Envy has to play more cautious in the mid lane because... They definitely have kill potential on him, just because of the tornado. The one issue will be now that they got a one kill. Right now he doesn't have enough sustain on the invoker, so his mana pool is very limited so far. He only has 200 mana, so setting up another kill is going to be hard without re regeneration. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to mention is bottom lane. Usually Nyx, the hard part for Nyx coming into a game is that he does never get the levels in, in time. So you won't expect an early level 6. But given that bottom lane, he reaches level 6 now, so... They have to watch out on all lanes, given he has that level 6, and he's going to rotate very soon. I believe that E is going to rotate bottom lane as soon as the lane gets a bit more problematic. They might set up another kill for on, on Envy here, but I believe he's going to rotate very soon towards the save lane so he can catch up in levels. Mid and lane. Yeah, they're going to have a crack at Fader. Again, they go for this decay. He just wants to TP himself out, and Fader making the perfect choice. There was no stuns available. In fact, that's actually the real big downside about this Na'Vi lineup that both the supports are not working with stunts. Avos doesn't, Queen of Pain doesn't. In fact, the Invoker is the only one who's got control factor. I wonder if that was a misplay by Seneca here, because Art, Art Style had just didn't have enough mana for the Soul Rip there. He had Soul Rip up, but he couldn't use it. He didn't have the mana, and I think it could have potentially turned into a kill, just because Soul Rip, Soul Rip level 1 actually does a lot of damage. So if he ended up tethering into the Undying... Potentially could have been the kill. Yeah. But then overcharge obviously wouldn't have been there for the Bristol back. Yeah. Well, at the same time, Fader, he's still able to escape. Oh, hello, bottom lane, Hand of God kicks in. The Sonic Wave did fly at Nick's Assassin, the Shadow Strike would have been enough to finish off the kill. And this is going to be a crucial phase now for bottom lane. Just because Nyx has to heal up, but where is he going to turn out to be? He has level 6, he can potentially gank, and he's setting up, he will potentially set up. We can see mid lane. Yep, it's the smoke gank coming in, and uh, they got troll traps, so Avos can't really go anywhere. Seneca actually lost the tether, it ran out of time. Fader, so low on life, the tower's attacking him. Balls won't reach him in time, however, and Seneca trying to reach too far out to get that last pick up on Fader to make the mid trade worth. It ends up just feeding his life and probably the tier 1 tower. You got a big army there. That was very unfortunate. Top lane, top lane. Well, also having a crack at EE. Uh, in comes Bone 7, right there for Dendi. He's got mana for a stun, and that's enough to get the kill, but he needs to be able to connect this on Dendi, who's, uh, yep, there it is. Hits the stun, and there's going to be three very quick kills for Cloud9. Bone 7 is still battling underneath the Undying Tombstone. There's a one-stick charge for him to use, which is enough for a Spike Carapace. It keeps Artstyle away, and they just back up. So they get the kill on the top, they take out the Tier 1 tower, as well as two tier heroes in the mid. 
I'll say uh, Cloud9 is very happy with the last one minute. Just looking at the experience graph in the, in the last minute, and it's going to spike up even more. It's just, that's a snowballing factor that can happen to Na'Vi here. This is what Na'Vi was meant to have happen for them. Like, it was meant to be the, that quick rotation in from the Queen of Pain. You jump in, you let off the Sonic Wave, you get a couple of kills, you keep Envy shut down. You use the power of the Undying Tombstone just to force Cloud9 out, out of the fights every time, but... You could argue for misplay here by by Soneko, just on a wisp, that he, he stopped at Heather, he ran too far range, he wanted to walk back with him, he ran out of the range when he got, uh, when DK stunned the Bristol back, and it could have potentially saved him, and then he saw the kill on the DK, but he did not hit the, the balls, and like the, the spirits, and he could not finish up the DK, then he got too greedy and died instead of that. It's very unfortunate, but this momentum, like I tried to mention early on, it can happen for Navi here, it's gonna be very, very difficult to come back or to rather have an up upside into the mid-game. Oh. is trying to force the issue up against Snaker. He's still a still has stick charger, so he's going to live through it all. But just screwing around with a lot of the stacks that were being done at the time. As we can see, Envy sort of gets sacrificed here a lot. But to me, Luna doesn't really have that big of a downside being sacrificed in an early game because it's a hero that can usually come back into the mid game, forms decent with the aura, and as soon as you get glaives you can catch up, but at the same time you have your level 6. Level 6 on Luna usually means your kill potential at least on one hero with a gank, no matter what. And right now what they're doing, what Cena is doing, they send the visage bottom, he almost has the birds ready, and as soon as that happens I think they will gather up to push. As you can see that they're smoking again towards bottom, slash maybe Roshan? No, they're heading towards bottom. To it's set up for a tower push slash gang. It's just a systematic move, like you've come up, you've killed off top, you've managed to kill off the middle. Like both the heroes are there, Funnick is the only one that hasn't been slowed down in progression at the moment. And you're seeing it with the CS, with, with the uh, net worth got 3k, and the best thing you can do, just kill him. Great Drops him back there. down, you see him go from 3k down to 2.7k. Great setup there by, by Bone, he, d he knew he just had to stun. Our art style. He completed the TP right in front of the tower, right in front of the heroes with the familiars up, and they just stunned him and killed him. Free goal. Very, very questionable play, and this is going to turn into it most likely two powers, Dyer's if not even more. It could be even a Roche kill, but I believe Dyer's they're going to they're going to settle for two towers. I'm not entirely Dyer's sure. Tombstone is still on cooldown as well, but they knew they, they know that Queen of Pain still has the the, the ultimate up. They still have the Sonic Wave. So potentially not going to go further. You have a double damage rune on a Dragon Knight who's in Dragon Form. They may just go to a Tier 3 tower now. Got the Alpha Wolf behind him. The Dragon Form's going to wear off in a moment, but it's still giving me enough time to get one attack into the tower. And that starts the Poison Tick. There's no fortification because they use it to defend the Tier 2 tower. So Dendi has to EMP Tornado, and this is all that mana from the creeps you're talking about. It's practically gone. They haven't fallen back. Like, the familiars are dropping down. Radiance top tower has I don't know if they're a bit... Uh, yeah, they can't even pick that one off. There's, there's not enough uh, attack speed from... In fact, there's only Denny attacking it. I think it was the right move by Cena here to push a bit further, just so you force everyone back um, and deal a bit of damage to the tier 3 tower, but I think they stayed a bit too long. They Speaking still of wanna... saying, they're going from bone 7. Once again, Art Style, attacking. the newest addition to Na'Vi. Finds himself being picked off, so you got no one dying here, and the rest of the C9 lineup is ready to go. Now they're going back into And the another push. EMP tornado. <laughs> oh, they got no mana in the tank apart from no Talos, mis Misery, and Envy, but Bone 7 and Fader are dry, but they already able to get that stun off. Funix blinks himself away to safety, but this tower's down now to half of his life. The Hand of God from Chen's going to trigger two to keep these creep waves alive. And they turn. Havost stunned up. The Eclipse is also going to go off here from Envy. And Havost getting beaten down. The Relocate pulling it back. And the Sora keeps him alive. Arstyle drops the Tombstone. They need to get rid of this nice and quickly. And they're able to do so. But another EMP tornado from Dendi. This control factor is just so big. No Tal wants to get out. But the Call Snap from Dendi cancelling the TP away. But at the same time, it's again Arstyle, the casualty of war, having his third death now here on the bottom lane. The Cloud9 resummoning of familiars, 
Some heavy damage coming in, and a big Sonic Wave from Funic, catching out most of Cloud9. There's still a lot of return with the Soul Rip damage. A Vorse is alive too. That physical DPS trying to find Versage and pick him off, and he's got him down too. That's another kill coming the way of Na'Vi. They chase after Fader, and Cloud9, they really try to force the issue, get a pre-15 minute GG call, and they may have just paid at the heftiest price they could have. At the same time, the Versage is getting a triple kill with just Familiars. So, uh... It's not a completely clean flight fight here for Navi. No, definitely not. I mean, I think Cena overstayed their welcome. That's what I meant uh, meant to mention earlier. The reason they did this is because I, I was like looking around trying to find like what's Dyer's the reason for them to push here. Attack. Like, why wouldn't they just wait out the dragon form a bit longer? You know, like gather back and mid lane. That's another free kill on our style here. It's also the Nyx Assassin, so we have to obviously understand the Nyx Assassin. It's a great ganker, but. Yeah, our style's been picked off a fair amount. Like, what's, what's this now? His fourth death in a very short space of time. Yeah. But going back to my point here, the reason mid lane? All right. It doesn't seem like anything is happening. So uh, when when Envy's running in with a haste and he wants something to happen. Funny's going to blink into the trees and very quickly starts to bottle up and a Vorse is going to have to also arrive. They saw it coming, though. The Observer Wards are down for both Radiant as well as uh, Dyer. Both of which are going to time out now. Envy. He's got 17-1 charges, so he's going to be okay. And a force can't dive too far. And he knows it. Okay. Um, the reason Cena wanted to push before was because they finished the mech. Even before mana was on the chance. So they thought they had a double heal advantage. But after everyone was on no mana, there was no purpose of pushing him. They could not finish anything there. So the overstaying was, in my theory, it was not the right call. But... What they're trying to do, I believe, now is just finishing mana boots on... I, I think they need two mana boots actually here to, to overcome the EMP damage or slash rather mana burn. It's not the damage really, it's more that the mana burn is the, the yep. bigger issue. Yeah. Because you, you, you're walking into a fight now with little to no stuns. Like, you got the familiar stuns, a loose and beam, yay. But you're taking the Nyx Impel out of it every single time. With a Spire Carapace, that was meant to really control up Na'Vi. You got a lineup which isn't building a single Radiant's BKB. That Nyx Assassin attack. wants to try and find stun timings Dyer's on them. Not to mention your Chen Creeps and everything they bring to the party. But the top tier one tower is going to be taken out by the Visage. So no surprise, Misery's being everywhere, but on the bottom lane, Fader. Well, it looks like he's in trouble, but now he's going to go Invis. Sentry Ward's down, so that Invis isn't helping him off, and Envy just lets off the Eclipse. A lot of it's being tanked up by a Vorse, and they relocate back out to safety. Arsal going to drop the Tomb, so which means now Misery's going to die, and Na'Vi getting back-to-back -back fights here. They do have Dendi with an EMP in five seconds time. He's also got Invoke now available as well. No tell, trapped in the tree line. Arsal and that Oldman form is a triple kill, and back for a Vorse, who was the man just letting off all the sprays. Bone 7 is still alive in here, and I think he's looking for a pick off on Dendi, and he's going to get it. The Troll Trap going to work here from Nortel, but Arsal's not giving up the fight. The Vort's getting rid of the Outforce, but from Bone 7, the Double Stun, the Tornado, Arsal, he's overstaying his welcome once again. Soul Rip him one second time, can keep him alive for the moment, and then a TP out. Bone 7, no stuns available. So uh, Spy Carapace will not cancel that TP. Obviously, he wasn't doing any damage to him, and the Vort will just uh, back himself out of that one too. Great momentum play here by Navi. They clearly um, they saw the one on one coming into the tower, so they they got one pick up after another, and I was I was a bit surprised how well this actually went for Navi there, given that I guess the relocate start onto the Dragonite where they could just pick up the Dragonite in time before anyone Dyer's could help out. But yeah, definitely great 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 showing here by Navi. Well, they're actually coming out on top of these fights, sort of. It's, they're at least giving a balance. As far as the experience goes, if you actually check out the graphs now, it's a full swing. A 4k swing just in the last 10 minutes going the way, first of Cloud9, then back the way of Na'Vi, leveling up the gold, and this could be one of these fun late games we might be forced into. Uh, Vos just now finished his Crimson, probably working towards... Looks like BKB. It could be a BKB, but it could also be a Hellbird. I think the evasion wouldn't be too bad. Because you have to tether, you have to link, so you might rather want to try to work around that. Especially because there's no real other tether target. Mm -hmm. is, so, is, is actually, is oh, is it Sanchin Yasha mo Yeah, it's I think it's actually going to be a Sanchin Yasha. It's not going to be a Hellbird. Yeah. Unless he's considering something else a little bit more unique of late. 
I doubt there's a there's enough reason to go for that silver edge over on a, over on a Bristol back. Now, later on, for sure, the number one attack. item you want to get on Bristol's Octane Core. That item on Bristol's skills very well. Well, you see if he's going to head that way for now. Navi, five man smoke up, heading themselves into the Radiant Jungle. We've got one Mud Golem trying to scout out who's where. And the rest of the 10 armies there too, and well, Tombstone down, Dandy did find the EMP Tornado, is over on Big Daddy, and he's got enough metal off the hand of God, but now he's completely bone dry, and they're chasing after Misery, and you said of Familiars do come up into the air, and they're going to drop down pretty quickly, and this will buy some time for getting four man stunts, and he's still inside the tree lines, and the breathe by hurt and hard, Sonic Wave as well, Vader, they got enough to survive, the big double stun as well, coming in from Bone 7, Navi get controlled, and they're basically being, well, I don't want to say choke pointed out inside the jungle, but that's what it feels like. That fight happened in such a small area, and now we've lost a little bit of space to be created by Denny's Tornado. But he's on the run from familiars that have their stomp. So one by one down, number two down, Bone 7 comes in, the Cold Snap slowing him down, but Havost, well, he's still got a little bit more mana, but no stick charges. The four star from Denny, not a tower to protect him yet. But he keeps his back to Cloud9. That's why he's so tanky. Another stun, Denny with the EMP. Okay, Cloud9 will finally give up on this, or will they? That's a real okay coming in from Sneeko and Avorst. It's like they want to try and fight, but Cloud9 this time they back up at the right time. They're going to find Bone7 up with the Tornado, and Avorst going to stick right behind him. They've still got the Sentry Ward there, but there's no mana for the vendet Vendetta. Even with now the 10 stick charges, he's still too short from this. Avorst waiting out perfectly. These stuns coming in from the Mud Golems before staffing Denny forward onto the Cold Snap. Bone 7 still not enough man to do anything. They're trying to actually, well, the Chen Creeps are being sent back, realizing that he is going to die. So Brusselback finds the kill after a very extended fight, which did not start well for Navi. So much action in this game. I actually think that um, Bone 7, if he would have waited on like two or three more charges, he could have. He could have been able to use his ultimate there and escape. Because there was no sentry rod to be laid down, so he would have been out, most likely. Um, other than that, the fight just dragged on too far, I think, for Cloud9. They just couldn't couldn't take down the Bristol. Great force step by Dendi here to protect him. I most likely would say that he could have died there if it wasn't for the force step. But then when Wisp got back in with a relocate, they had to turn and that resulted in the death of Bone 7. But overall, it's still, I would say, a good fight for C9, just not great enough. Well, this is going to hurt him as well. They're scouting it out with the Sentinel who's moving in, but with Nasal Goo, they got the negative armor to burn through Roshan. It's not as though they have the wonderful perk up of having something like a Medallion and cur Courage as well. But you've managed to find over 200 physical damage on the Brussels back just because of the Warpath. Also to note too, um, I don't know if this is on purpose, but uh, Havos didn't put the second point up into Warpath. He's level 11 and only got one point up in Warpath. Mm. I mean, you go from, you go from 5 to 6 stacks, there's a bit more damage. I'm not sure why he chooses to do that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm watching Bone 7 just be such a dick to art style. And now, well, the EMP's gonna burn him up. Soneko does manage to relocate himself in, trying to give a little bit more help here. The Spirit's not enough damage to kill off Bone 7, but Avorst, as well as Denny, they move forward. Sonic Wave in from Funning, still having killed off Bone 7. It was the mech to do some work, and Avorst, Crimson Guard and One Charges keep his life up quite high. Fader just wants to get out of this one. So it's a Nyx for an Undying as the trade off, but a heavy commitment from both sides to bring players in. Apart from Envy, he did not want to come, he was busy farming. I just realized one very, very cheeky play or like item pickup by by Fata here. Once he finishes that Silver Edge, you're gonna take away the entire Bristol back, the passive from Bristol back. So he, they can pretty much, they know it's down, they just nuke him down. If he doesn't have a BKB to negate that, mm -hmm. he's gonna drop really quick without even noticing that he, he, that is happening. So he has, it, he has it finished now and I'm pretty sure that Fata will call for it, will go for Bristol, and he will drop very quick, showing his back. It does not matter, because it just takes away the entire passive. Yep. And, uh, well, he can only expose the Vorst's weakness and build then. Because it would have been very easy. In fact, it is going to be the SMY for a Uh It would have been very easy just to build into that BKB for a Vorst. It's not though he was short of money. And they're going to try and punish it. Bone 7 finds an echo, misses the stun, however. And, uh, well, Funnick quickly up there, goes for the Shadow Strike. They want to try and pick up Bone 7 and really punish him hard. 15 one charges are available, he's going to use all of them right now. But there's no other teammates coming to help him out. That's so there's still very, death no matter what. That's a very costly play. He went for he went for the Wisp there. He thought he could just get out real quick. But I actually think 
with having no dagger, he knew he didn't have a TP up because he just TP middle. As you could see before that Navi actually pinged him out, but that's a minor play. It doesn't matter if they ping him out or not. He missed the play, and even if going for that play and he kills the Wisp, it, it's going to result into a kill. If if Navi is around, and they, they were definitely around, you could even see it. Almost all of the members of Navi being middle. A little bit of a mistake, but also controlled by misery. Uh, Whisk got stunned up during the last second of his, of, of his relocate. So we ended up uh, tethering and bringing the Brussel back all the way back to base again. It works at the end of the day, but it just means that uh, Art Styles the man has to soak up the experience in the mid. It's really important for Arstad here to get that experience and gold on the Nyx. Like he gets some of that gold, you know, it's a kill. And now with the change of cloak as well, 5% more magic resistance is quite some. It's not that little. And it will definitely help our style to survive the next year. Fade up. Seneco starts on him. They're going to trigger the dust. There's no way for Fade up. Well, he can't go in physically anyway. But a Vorse might be a little bit more trouble. Here comes that Tombstone. Art style still the front lines. Decay taking as much of the life away from Cloud9 as possible. A Vorse lives for such a long period of time as Denny's EMP burns out Cloud9. So there's nothing available. And then the Sonic Wave in with the Scream. They're so low, but they're not going to die. Scream in two seconds' time. But it's the Aegis Immortal on the back of the Queen of Pain. That be careful about. Big Day's got 25 HP, but Fader already got himself a triple kill. The blink away by Funic, he's out to safety. And Cloud9 take a 3 for 0 trade off after what was a large amount of damage from Funic, but nothing to put him in. And in fact, it was a, sorry, a 4 for 0 when you take into, into account the Aegis as well. So, what, so far, what I noticed throughout the entire game, I feel like that Funic has not really just been there when the fight started. He was never really in the fight, he always came in kind of late. I'm not sure if it's communication issues between them still, you know, just that he, he came, just came back into the team and, you know, the, it's not 100% on par again, but it just feels like, I'm not sure, like, he's just a tiny bit too late, right? Yeah. But that, that's also probably because a lot of these fights are happening when he's not really expecting them to happen. That's very true as like, well. Like Cloud9, five men smoke up and then aggressively come into your ancients at 23 minutes into the game. I, are you really expecting this after Roshan's also gone down? Battling up against you when you've got an Aegis the Immortal in your hands? It's, it's probably not the most expected thing in the world. True, but then again, they chose to take the fight, so once they start taking the fight, everyone should be ready. Like, when you when you choose to get that fight going, you see us in, they might have expected that Fata would be, you know, maybe having plus one, but it was the entire team there, of course, but then, I, I don't know, I felt like it was just too much of a rush in, where no one was exactly ready. And if they would have taken the fight from start on with Funny, Funny would have killed two, three people there. They're coming down from bottom lane, the relocate in from Snaker, trying to force Bones as far away as possible. Misery, okay, with the familiar damage, Snaker's gonna drop. A force might be isolated. The deafening blast arrives from Denny at the right time, stunning up Misery, but he's got three familiars here. Perfectly micro to control up a force and dandy, but the tornado is still too powerful. Reaches down to him and uh, Misery with a call snap. He'll get one solid assumption damage out, but now he's gonna be careful about losing his familiars. The Crimson Gun helping to protect Dandy, and they're able to pick off one of these familiars. And the upgrade, the in, like one thing to just mention is that the change in familiars, I just, I don't know, I feel like they're just too powerful. Like four charges, I mean four hero hits to kill one familiar yep. seems very absurd. Just because you you don't have ever a chance to just burst one, you can't burst a familiar ever. And if you can't burst them, they like the damage is insane. Mm -hmm. It's mm. Well, one I, thing I, to I, mention. We're not even seeing it in, in combination with the draw ranger or anything. It's it's just familiars by themselves where they are now. I feel like the playstyle of of uh, C9 here seems very like the start seemed very good on them. But I feel like they kind of fell apart in terms of... Usually they're not a team that 5-on-5s. Five five. They're not. They're not a team that groups up and 5-on-5s. Five Invoker obviously has a big impact on that. You have an EMP to stop the pushes. Tornado MP, you know, it's, it's hard. But Tornado MP still has a cooldown. Like, it's not just that easy. Snake out. Bone 7. It's <sighs> so another moment where Snake has managed to dodge him out. He wants to tether up and try and help save Funic, but cannot do so. The short range relocate was what he was searching for. Now Danny with the tornado does manage to pick up Fader, but it's too deep out. He doesn't know what else is sitting inside of his own jungle. So they had to be more patient. That's done. Oh, art style. A full tombstone as well as ultimate being committed from him. And they know Fader's coming back for more. They just lost two spirit balls to him. 
And if they don't watch out, this can end very crucial here for Navi. The top tower is, is for sure an objective here for them to take. It's quite low. They're trying to gather up for top, as you can see. And he's also. Control. First Centaur stun, then Nyx stun, then Dragon Tail, and Avorce, the Tornado, is coming in too late. One charges, Soul Rip, Crimson Guard, how much have you got? Sineko with the Meg Charge and Tether. They keep Avorce alive, but again, the commitment's just so high to make it happen. No Tail sending back Fader. He'll TP back at himself, and these Familiars, they actually find Dendi, four stuff away at the right time. Evading Bone Sevens Impale, and that mount may, might mean the Bone Sevens gonna drop. The Centaur army coming up from, uh, from no tail, but it can't do much more here. So again, Bone 7. This is actually, like, what, the third time we've now seen a, a disengagement from Cloud9 when Bone 7 is just left, bi left behind. In the meantime, though, Envy is, gonna get, is getting quite some space to form. Bottom, though, is getting initiated on. Well, even relocate in for it, but Envy's able to TP out in time. Just know what he's able to stop that TP. Oh, look at him come onto the top lane. Like, you've just lost the Undying here, Denny's hanging around, McLeod and I know exactly where they're coming back to, but then again, they're not committing properly to the fight. Is there a stun? Is there... No, Denny doesn't have anything available. His invoke was on cooldown, so all he could do was throw down, what, a cold wall and actually went for alacrity? That was a great event, uh, was a great event as well. So they go! 99 HP. The Chen army, no tail, was right behind him as well, but Dragon Knight is the man who's doing most of the work. Slowing down now onto a Vost. I'll send him up and towards the air and buy that space to retreat back out again. These Navi supports just keep dying. Like Wisp is 0, 6, 10. And you're actually looking at the Undying, he's 8 deaths as well. I feel like Snake has not been out of position this game though. He played... He did play fine, you know, like you can... You can give him that mid play where he overextended and he broke the tether. That's maybe on him. That's usually a team play thing though, you know, how you move with a tether. The other thing is, I feel like art style got picked up too many times here. Yep. He was just out of position, trying to get farm. It's, I mean, one thing, of course, you want to pick up farm and levels, as, you know, if a lane is free, you want to try to pick up that farm. They need a farm for Undying as well. And it's one of those heroes that actually scales pretty decent with getting some levels and farm. It's pretty good on him, but at the same time, you know they have a Nyx, and he's not showing up on the map, and as well as, you know, as soon as Dragon Eye has a Shadow Blade, he's also gonna go for you. So you just, you can't just farm alone. Unless you know you you see a certain hero on the map, you can do it. But if not, you just have to play safer or play around a sentry ward. Just play around his core. Like that's <laughs> I almost feel like art style is uh, Soul Rip, keep a force alive, and that's the goal. Roshan he's is scouted he's got his BKB now. Roshan is scouted by both teams, and it seems like that Navi's actually trying to attempt that Roche. Well, they could be quick about it. Then he's got a lot more control of the next fight. He's finished that side of device now on the Invoker. And so they, they got good control from him. And they could be too late. One thing I'd like to mention here again, before in the top lane, you could see the Silver Edge play coming. Bone uh, 7. Careful! The Hex, the Undying Tombstone. Eat. Okay, I... This almost feels like that TP from our style on the bottom lane. A team is doing Roshan, you know you're up against a Nyx Assassin, you're gonna drop a Sentry Ward to make sure he can't come in there and just snipe out. Especially in fact, I think they, they bought a gem too before the start of the fight. I mean, the gem is to be not expected, but Sentry Wards around Rosh area, especially if you know that they're going for it, they have a ward and they saw them walking into it. It was no smoke, no nothing. They yep. saw how they walked in, so... Questionable play here. They're top relocating lane. top lane. Yep, coming in after Misery. If they can get rid of this Visage as well with Nyx Assassin down, it will come at a cost, however, as once again Artstar being left behind. That's the Wisp. Is he actually going to bring back the Bristleback as well? Yeah, he does. Avorce will be here. And look at Sineko dying to the Eclipse of Eternal Envy. And there is more support here from Queen of Pain, but then again, is there. He has to blink himself away, and Avorce will just get nuked down. The Agency Mortar will trigger. Dendi is on his way, but doesn't have Tornado skilled up at the moment. In fact, Fader is sitting there and waiting for him. Going to isolate him with the Familiar, so Dendi's going to drop too. And Avorce BKBs TPs out. So he had the ability to escape, yet then he still tried to come in and save him and lost his life for it. Cloud9, great read, and also great vision with all their, with all their ops wards. Definitely. They went for a smart play there, and I think just Dying knowing you're in tower. front of the Some tower attack. of C9, do you want to take that risk? I mean, obviously they thought having that Aegis, they would be fine. Dying and Bristol has no problems. At the same time, you really can't underestimate Silver Edge plus Luna damage. 
the, the ultimate on one target is just too high. There's your fortification now coming up from Na'Vi. The Tombstone as well as the Decay being used on Fader. He's going to be careful. He's dropping pretty quickly up against the Vorsen. Nigga coming in too. Arstal, however, he just dies so quickly. With the Visage Familiars focusing him down. A Vor still trying to get back to front lines, but Fader taking away this pass. And watch a Vor side finally comes back in for another scream, but there's nothing more to scream about. They're just dying left, right, and center. Seneco is the only sole survivor for Na'Vi, even though Denny will respawn now in one second. They will lose their mid racks and they're going to lose Seneco. He's going to relocate back onto the spot. Fader was waiting for him. So the Wisp will drop. And the beautiful thing about Glaze, once you've gone through the towers, the buildings are just so easy to mop up after that. That's exactly what they're doing. In fact, the Glaze are bouncing so far up. They're helping Bone 7 try and kill off Dandy. But Dandy's not going to let Bone 7 get out of here. In fact, he's in range now of the top tier 3 tower. And that's enough damage. Bone 7 will drop. Eternal Envy also coming in a little bit too deep. But there's no one else from Na'Vi apart from Denny to try and slow this down. In fact, the Familiars took out the tier 3 tower in the bottom lane too. I mean, all in all, like, looking at both lineups again, I feel like it, the lineup of Cena is just easier to execute. I, I think Na'Vi played pretty good. They had a decent to execute plan, but they have to make a lot more happen. They can't just 5-on-5. Five five. It's, it's very hard, and you fight into a team such as, C uh, as Cena's lineup here, it's very hard to take that 5-on-5. Five five. Anyone Dyer's drops. If Bristol, I'm actually attack. curious how Silver Edge works with a BKB. I'm not entirely sure if he can just perch it off. But he drops as soon as he gets hit. He can't just walk into into the fight, even if he shows his back. Top lane. Yep, they can have a crack at Envy. Denny was there for the call snap, so Envy gets caught out in the top lane. He actually bought up his BKB before death and still has enough money for a buyback. At the same time, you now get the full Assault Curas over on the Dragon Knight. So many things for C9 to win every single fight from in, in the future. Dyer's middle tower to me, Visage just attack. seems outrageously strong. Like that hero, the, the birds just... You don't even get to deal with them. Like, before, you know, you, you pick like one of the counters and you still had to deal with birds. Like, in a 5 on 5, you still get a crazy amount of damage out of that hero. And now, with the, the bird, uh, with the familiars, it's, it's very, very hard. Wow. That's uh, that's an efficient kill. Just shadow blade yourself in. Say so shadow blade, silver edge yourself in. And with the Nyx assassin walking around with the day gone and the mana burn, they just had everything they needed to kill off, kill off the invoker. And there was nothing the funny could do about it. No, definitely. I mean, then, then in that case. <laughs> that's, look, look at this army. Uh, you have yourself the army of the Chen combining up with the familiars. You can't stop this this push, and the crazy thing is too, you can do it as a, as a full split push because the familiars of the Chen army push up. Chen can bring his entire army back to himself, and then you could just have the familiars also be re-summoned. So your split push can turn into a direct push too. They don't even have to be re-summoned just because it's so hard to kill familiars now. Four hits, it's it takes a lot of... it takes more than one hero to do that. It, it really does. Bone Seven's waiting for a little bit of help here in mid. Avost, attack once, spike Carapace, follow up stun, and then blinks away as Seneco jumps in. There was no more help coming in from Fader, and that's the one he was searching for. He needs the Silver Edge to get rid of that Brusselback passive. And I think looking at the item creation of Bone here is probably gonna aim towards an Octane Core to reduce all his spells' cooldown. I mean, the life is not the bigger part for this hero, obviously, but the cooldown on all the spells, especially Mana Burn. Mana Burn is going to drop to 3 seconds instead of instead of 4. It's That's 1 Mana Burn into a stun, into a Mana Burn. You will get almost 2 Mana bur Burns off on one hero, which means on, on a hero such as Invoker, 2 Mana Burns means more than half of your HP. It's, it's ridiculous. Also the beauty of, it, of something like a Vendetta too. Uh, you're always going to have your ultimate, even twice during team fights. Oh, not to mention actually the way Vendetta works. Initiation. Here they come. Yep, stun. Look at our style. He just explodes so quickly. They try and keep him up. There's buyback time, but there's only Bristleback who's got it. And of course, he's standing his ground up against Envy. At least his cool spray start to stack up. And Na'Vi, they've done very well to keep as many of these players alive as possible. Dendi is still going to end up dropping as Seneco troll trapped up. They have to get rid of this wisp. Now, of has lost his extra buffer. And they've also lost their bottom rags. And I think this is almost the time to call. In fact, there it is from our style. He's had enough of getting killed. It was already 11 deaths for him in just this first game of the series. 
But uh, Cloud9, they kind of felt like they were trying to force the issue a little bit too early, but they still win the game at the end of the day. And that's yeah. what counts. No, definitely, I think they forced it a bit too early. Overall, good performance by them. They, I would say they still had the game from the start to the mid-game. There was one upsetting moment when they got the Roche and they lost two team fights in a row, but still, as soon as they grouped up, there was almost no chance for Navi to win the team fights. And we saw that. We saw that very clearly. And, uh, well, we'll see how clear it's going to be in game number two. We'll have ourselves a short break and come back to see if Cloud9 can take it out 2-0 and get that ticket punch to Frankfurt to visit it again. Cloud9 were, of course, attending there last time. Navi was directly invited, obviously. No way that nowhere near the same team as they were back then. But uh, we'll see how they go. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll have a break, and we'll be back here in just a moment. <laughs> 